Uh, so this is our uh, our second panel, and uh, Dilip Ratha, head of migration and remittances unit uh, at the World Bank, is going to talk to us, as I understand it, from a vi video conference. Where is he? Washington. He's in Washington. So <laughs> certainly not here. Uh, I, I just say something a little bit about, about him. Um, that I, I read something in the New York Times that, say, that says that um, Dilip, there's no one that has done more than Mr. Atta to make migration and its potential rewards a top of the agenda concern in the world development uh, ministries. And I think we can fairly say um, that Dilip has worked really tirelessly to reduce money transfer fees and to increase the productivity of money that's being sent. So we're very pleased to, um, to welcome him to speak to us here today. And we're very sorry you couldn't be here in person, but uh, th this is very, very much a, a, a good second best. So please. Well, thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity. Are you able to hear me all right? Yes, it's all very good. Great, thank you. Uh, first, I wanted to congratulate the authors, uh, Kevin and his co-author, for an excellent report. Um, it is, um, uh, this is me speaking, if you can't see me, so we maybe I'll see move yet. my hand. We'll see your hand. <laughs> <laughs> There you are. So, oh, you were worth waiting for. <laughs> so I, I first wanted to congratulate the authors, uh, Kevin and ODI, for taking on a very important issue. Uh, while we have been working with the G20 and uh, in our own ways through the Global Remittances Working Group, keeping the fire burning, uh, I felt that uh, the momentum was flowing down a bit, and I suddenly realized that the, this particular report and your event out there has really galvanized interest <laughs> in this topic. Uh, and uh, there is a lot of press coverage, and I'm really uh, happy that you have taken it up again. Uh, and congratulations to the authors, and thank you very much for also inviting me to share some thoughts. What, uh, I, what I would like to do is to uh, first uh, talk a bit about the importance of remittances and give you some latest numbers, which are already reflected in the ODI report. But I, I, we, re we last week released uh, new remittance estimates and projections. I'll just give you a few words about that first to put things in perspective on the importance of remittances. Then I'll talk about reducing remittance costs and uh, then uh, I would go just a little beyond uh, reducing remittance costs. What are the other items of global remittances agenda and uh, how this issue of remittances and migration could perhaps also contribute to the post-2015 development agenda and financing for development discussions. Uh, and I, I hope to do that within, the, uh, within less than 10 minutes. Importance of remittances, we released uh, last uh, uh, Friday new data showing that uh, in uh, 2013, officially recorded remittances reached $404 billion. And in 2014, that is this year, we expect remittance flows to developing countries to rise to $436 billion. And by 2016, we expect remittance flows to developing countries to reach $516 billion. If we also look at flows for uh, the, the world as a whole, including high income countries, um, the total flows would add about another $160 billion, $160, $170 billion to the number. These are all officially recorded data. If you then included flows that are not recorded in official statistics, then the market size globally is likely to be a trillion dollars. And in the developing countries, it is definitely more than half a trillion dollars as we speak. For many countries, remittances are more than half of the GDP. For especially small countries and poorer countries, and conflict-afflicted countries, lifeline uh, remittances actually provide a lifeline to the poor people in those countries. And 
some uh, citation of uh, you know importance of remittances. Tajikistan remittances are more than 50 percent. Haiti it is the same. In Nepal remittances are larger than tourism receipts. In Sri Lanka they are larger than TA. In Lesotho they are larger than gold exports. In uh, Egypt they are larger than uh, revenue from Suez Canal. And the list goes on and on. I, I won't uh, harp on that problem point too much. I think you are already wedded to that idea. Just wanted to point out two important things about remittances, uh, two further important things. One is that during the crisis, they did not fall. There was only a fall of 5% and then quick recovery. And that is sort of the tendency we see also in situations of crisis, and go a natural disaster or during an earthquake or, or typhoon or, or during conflict, remittances are the first form and the persistent form of help that stay with the people who need help. So that is a very important point to keep in mind. That then leads us to the uh, point about the high cost of remittances. While worldwide remittance costs have fallen from somewhere around 12% five years ago to somewhere around just over 8%, 8.4% according to our latest data. Uh, now, costs in Sub-Saharan Africa have stubbornly stayed high at 12%. They have not come down at all. And then, if you look at South-South remittances within Sub-Saharan Africa, then costs are even higher. They can be as high as 30%, if they're allowed, that is. Actually, in most South-South corridors, remittances are just not allowed through the formal channel, which means cost is infinity. Where it is allowed, costs can be as high as 30%. So there is a reason for us to think about lowering remittance costs and accelerating our, our uh, efforts to lower remittance costs two countries in Sub-Saharan Africa and within the Sub-Saharan Afri African region itself. To put things pers in perspective again, Africa has a population of let's say 700 odd million people. Sub-Saharan Africa has a population of less than you know a billion people. Whereas uh, uh, countries like India or China each have a billion people. What that means is for Sub-Saharan Africa with its 47 countries, migration is actually more of a fact of life and intra-regional migration is actually way more dominant than in any other region. What that also means is that South-South remittances, intra-regional remittances are that much more important to the poor people of those uh, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. So there is the need to reduce remittance costs. How should we do it? And in that context, one way we might think about drawing an analogy from telecom industry is the first mile the second mile and the last mile sort of analogy. First mile being the source country for remittances, second mile being the transmission channel, and last mile being the destination country for remittances or beneficiary country for remittances. What can we do in those countries? A couple of points, anti money laundering and the countering of financing of terror, AML, CFT regulations that are implemented for maintaining financial integrity to fight financial crime. Those regulations are not helping remittances at all. Indeed, there is that situation of thinking about fighting crime, but at the same time, a bit like the security checks in the airport, the way it has gone kind of berserk in many places. Uh, if you are not white, if you are brown, then the the beep will go up. If you are poor, in the case of remittances, then you need more documentation for AML CFT compliance. And in fact, most of the regulatory bodies will tell you that most of the time the alarm goes off that some remittance transaction is wrong or something. Actually, those are false alarms. Indeed, there is very little fact to show all remittance transactions are associated with financial crime. In fact, most of the small remittance transactions are for genuine um, purposes of day-to-day -day needs of, of people, of actually poor people. So some sort of balancing is required on AML CFT 
by simply sort of recognizing that if remittances are below 1,000 pounds or 3,000 pounds or 1,000 euros, just make up the number, below that amount, uh, actually there is very little risk of anti-money laundering, uh, very little risk of money laundering or terrorist financing or financial crime. And that would go a long ways in uh, uh, facilitating remittances, bringing down costs, because that would reduce the cost of compliance for money transfer businesses. The second uh, major issue, which has been highlighted also in the ODI report, is uh, exclusivity contracts between typically national post offices or national banking systems and on the one side and leading one leading money transfer company or the other leading money transfer company on the other side. These exclusivity contracts are actually a tax on people. And it is a regressive tax because it's a poor people who can't avoid it and they pay more. So it is highly regressive. And even when both of the first mile and the last mile, the source country for remittances and the beneficiary country for remittances, the countries have wedded to the idea of reducing remittance costs. At the same time, their own state organs, post office or a banking system or sometimes other agencies, are actually imposing a tax by entering into these exclusive partnerships and that defeats market competition, that discourages entry of new players into the market and keeps costs high. Now, money transfer companies provide a very useful service, so we should allow them to function and we should recognize that. And so nobody is saying you take away your profit, we want to reduce your profit, but I think what we need to do is to level the playing field and open the market up, open up the partnerships to anyone who is going to play ball and provide remittance services at the right price. That is the only way you should go about it. And there is the example of the telecom industry. Think about the cost you used to pay per minute for making that international call just about five years ago or just about a decade ago. And just actually when you were students, how much you paid when you were really poor and what you are paying now. You are paying nothing now, and that is actually what the technology would allow. That is where the technology can take us in terms of cost reduction for remittance transactions. I am talking about nothing. I am actually talking about nothing as the cost. So if the cost is even 1%, that is too high. Cost at 12% is exorbitantly <coughs> high. So AML CFT has to be rebalanced, exclusivity contracts between post offices, or national banking systems and on the other side money transfer companies has to be uh, remake and the partnership should be opened up. Introducing new technology would help, in particular mobile phone technology and MPESA has really um, shown that remittance costs can be reduced significantly through adoption of technology. We need to allow that sort of model, business model to proliferate for international cross-border remittances as well. And I'm quite heartened to hear yesterday and more recently that Facebook is planning to get into this market. And I hear that Google is getting into this market. And I just encourage them to really get into this market. Only thing, only thing is not only focus on the people with internet access, not only focus on people with bank and banking access, not only think about banked people, but also think about unbanked people that is where most of the sub-Saharan Afri sub African people are. That is where most of the poor people are. Most of the poor people don't like banks and the dislike is mutual. <laughs> poor, people, banks. poor people don't like banks because bankers just hate poor people. And if you are thinking about a bank-based model for finding solution to remittance cost reduction, you are barking the wrong tree. That is never going to happen. So we have to think about actually non-banking sector, and I quite like the simplicity of the money transfer business. It's one of the simplest forms of business. And in that context, I really think that the post offices have just the right sort of business model because nobody feels uncomfortable walking into a post office, whereas a lot of people feel uncomfortable walking into a bank. So move away from bank-based models to simpler money transfer um, services. And of course, financial development would help. Of course, doing away with exchange controls would help. In the context of South-South remittances, 
outward exchange controls that many national authorities have imposed uh, often to safeguard foreign exchange reserves, that actually is a major, major problem for uh, keeping uh, outward remittance costs high in the concept of a uh, number of African countries. But this is also true about most developing countries. There are restrictions on outward exchange controls. And then in many countries, there are also re re uh, restrictions on inward exchanges. So if you are sending money from, let's say, Benin to Ghana, then first money has to be exchanged, you know, first, it, it is actually allowed, so that is, that is a good news. Um, in many countries, that is not even allowed. But in the case of Benin, it is allowed. But first, the CFA has to be trans transferred, you know, uh, into either euro or pound sterling or dollar. And then in Ghana, it has to be transferred back into the local CD. On both sides, you pay the foreign exchange uh, commission. What that means is, um, you know, some sort of regional currency markets, if there is some sort of trading facilitated, and the exotic markets are not considered exotic anymore, there is no need to consider them exotic. That would go a long way in bringing down the foreign exchange commission and reducing south-south uh, remittance costs. Now, let me say a couple of words in two minutes, and then I will stop if that is okay with you. Um, beyond reducing remittance costs, which I think is going to be, we will be, we'll make a lot of progress in the next three years. Uh, I think the global remittance agenda has four items. One item is reducing remittance costs, that is uh, in the retail payment systems. Fighting uh, financial crime in the context of retail payments is another item in that second item. Uh, but there is the issue of data, there is the issue of linking remittances to financial products at the household level, and then there is linking remittances to capital market products at the country level. These are other items, and in particular, I would really encourage all of us to think about uh, when we are thinking about going beyond remittance costs to linking remittances to financial products at the household level. Saving products, loan products, deposits, micro insurance. I am particularly excited about the possibility of linking remittances to health insurance at the individual level. That is something really worth paying attention to. Finally, a word about post-2015 agenda. I don't think reducing remittance costs is a 30-year issue. If it is a 30-year issue or if it's a 20-year issue uh, for, for next 20 years, I think we should be ashamed of it. Remittance costs should fall in the next two or three years. Not They should not be speaking around uh, as at, at high levels for next 20 years. So I don't think reducing remittance cost is a post-2015 objective, but I think reducing migration costs is a post-2015 development objective. And I think we should be going after reducing recruitment costs. And uh, uh, just to tell you a statistic, a Bangladeshi worker trying to get a construction job in Dubai pays about two years of expected wages as recruitment costs to recruitment agents, and most of that is actually illegal. So I think we should next think about reducing recruitment costs for construction workers as a global development goal. Let me stop there, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts with you. Thank, thank you very much indeed. And uh, again, I think we've had a very frank and encouraging analysis um, uh, and unique insights from inside the World Bank are always very interesting uh, for us to hear. Uh, I wondered uh, whether you would be prepared to take a couple of questions now, because you probably won't stay until the end of the session, will you? Should, should I, uh, is, it, is that OK with you, or are you in, in a hurry? I would be very happy to take some questions now. Okay, thank you. Please. Please raise your hand if you have a question. Um, Elizabeth Blunt, Erin News. I was interested in what you said about it actually being illegal to make transfers between some African countries. Um, I wondered if you could give us a couple of examples and explain why. Mm -hmm. Thank you. As the gentleman at the back, just next to the screen. I, I just wondered, have you ever explored um, 
remittances, the, uh, the impact of remittances and, and development? Because we hear a lot about uh, development-related financing happening in, in lots of Africa, but we don't hear uh, where the remittances sit within that context. I could not hear the question very clearly. If uh, someone could kindly repeat that, I'll appreciate that. Hi. Um, is the mic on? Yeah. Um, Eliza Nyangwe from The Guardian. Um, my question, actually I've got two questions. The first one um, is we talk often about um, M-Pesa being a good example of how this could be done. How much is M-Pesa actually used for transferring remittances specifically. Uh, and my second question is, um, we're always talking about the potential of remittances to, you know, for development, but remittances are at the discretion of the giver and not some official financial flow. So how do you convert someone's you know, personal money to their family member into some form of uh, state-controlled, state-mediated mm -hmm. aid? Perhaps you can, perhaps you can uh, take, take those two questions. Uh, Madam Chair, I actually couldn't hear the two questions properly. Oh, okay, I, I wasn't sure about that. Well, perhaps we'd better leave it then. I'm sure you, you have to leave, and p the, perhaps uh, people here can ask the questions of, of others later on uh, during the meeting. I'm sorry about that, but obviously the technology is not working that well. So thank you very much indeed uh, to you for, for, for being with us this afternoon. We've really appreciated you giving us your time. Thank you. If, if I could ask speakers to maybe keep themselves to around seven minutes max, that would be good because then we can hope people will have probably quite a lot to say towards towards the towards the end. Um, just before we move on to the names you have on the panel, you remember that I said that Gibral Fall was held up in Moldova and couldn't be here, um, but um, we we have Onichakachi Wambi who was. Um, to, to me. And the Kachi Wambi. That, see, that's the rhythm <laughs> I, I don't have. <laughs> uh, so Anakachi is very, very gallantly offered to come and give us what he thinks uh, he Gibral might might have said, and I'll test you on this. 